Well, the SEC Network has picked up Saturday's game as well against Florida, so as far as I've been told. I think the guy who's coming on the show with us now would know that too. Kyle Peterson, ESPN baseball analyst, uh, former major leaguer, joining us here on Halftime. He'll be on the call for, well, Kyle, I know you got at least the first two Arkansas-Florida games. I think the Saturday is also on the network too, isn't it? Yeah, you're stuck with me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that, my friend. What, what a bummer. That just means fewer listeners on the network because more people will watch it. But I also think, hey, I'm fired up for you because are these going to be like your last games to do uh, in your in, in your house? And because you get to go to Hoover next week for the tournament, right? Well, yeah, I'll be in Hoover, which is awesome. I mean, I haven't done a game on site since the Little League World Series in 2019. Um. So that'll feel weird, but I I think we're doing regionals and potentially even supers from home. So no, it won't be the last, but it'll be uh, it'll be the last before we actually. It's fun. We get this whole tech stream going with everybody that's going to Hoover, and I mean, you'd think that like we're twelve year old kids going to Disneyland for the first time. I mean, it is. <laughs> people are so excited just to get there and see it in person. I I cannot wait. You know, I've always liked going to Birmingham and Hoover, but yeah, I I never would have treated it like the biggest uh, the biggest uh, yeah. destination like like Cooperstown or something. But it does make sense. And but before you get into the tournament, you're gonna I mean you got a crazy finish here to this regular season because I mean I know Arkansas has the you know can can you know so called control their own destiny, but you get three teams separated by one game, four teams separated by two games, and five teams separated by two games. This is this is an awesome finish to what's been an incredible regular season in the SEC. Yeah, it's it's fun. And I think it's I, I think it makes Hoover I don't know if you can make it better, but it 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 makes it as as high intensity as it can be. I think for all the reasons that that happened last year that didn't happen last year. Um, you know, kids look at it different. Coaches look at it different. Everybody looks, fans look at it different because we didn't have it. Um, and and I think that's where the excitement is is just going to be as high as it's ever been. And you're right. I think we're going into a weekend this weekend that you start running permutations and, and you know, everybody wants to win the league. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's also really important to be top four. So you don't have to play that game on Tuesday. It gives you an extra day. You can set your pitching a little bit different. So this is, I mean, there's a million different things going on this weekend that not only affect Hoover, but obviously affect national seeds and hosts. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and Arkansas has been in an interesting position because we've been playing in a lot of full stadiums of late, which included Mississippi yeah. State when they said they weren't filling it up, Ole Miss when they did say they were filling it up, uh, LSU when they said they were going to fill it up and didn't, and then – Tennessee, which was nuts this past weekend. Yeah, um, I wonder. Well, what did you make when you saw? Well, all right. When you watched any of the games that from this past weekend, and then when you saw what happened between DVH and and Tony Vitello, I'm sure that raised your eyebrows too. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I mean, Tennessee's a really cool story, just because you know there was a lot of baseball history there. It had just been a long time. I mean, we they knocked us out of the College World Series in '95 when they had help. That's before Berkey got there. But I mean, it went 20 years basically to where there just wasn't a whole lot going on. And to see a fan base come back like that, I understand. You know, it's hostile. I'm sure there's some things said that shouldn't be said. Whatever. I just the environment was was really cool to see on TV. I'll tell you that. And I would assume, I know it got heated, but it's also really cool to compete in in environments like that um, when you haven't had them for a long time. And, and if you've played there, you haven't had them there. So it was cool. And the stuff at the end, you know, I was talking to somebody about it this morning on a separate show that it's, it's two guys that are, are competitive, obviously know each other. Well, it's as competitive a series you can possibly get. Fans are going nuts. I credit Tony afterwards for kind of owning up to it right away, or at least the, the clip that I saw was in basically saying, Hey, I made a mistake. Um, but it's, it's, it's emotions and, and emotions are okay. Like that's, you know, we, we can't only want, we can't want emotions and, and not assume that sometimes they're not going to get a little bit out of hand. And I'm glad that it just ended the way that it did. Yeah. I think that's a good point. We do want the sport played with emotion. Um, so, and, and, and sometimes I might be a little overboard criticizing some of the emotion here and there, but we do love the emotion that these guys play with and the coaches coach yeah. with. 
you know, and I think Dave is one of the all time greats. I think Tony's on his way there too. You know, your your college coach though, I saw Mark Marcus, it was uh, it was the fifth winningest coach all time college baseball, is now gonna go into the college baseball hall of fame. It was just in just yeah. announced he's gonna be inducted. Do you feel like and I don't know if this would go for players, but I kind of feel like co- great college coaches kind of belong in Cooperstown because they really have had yeah. this amazing impact upon the game. We're talking for four decades in some cases. And, you know, like you see in college basketball, coaches go into the Naismith Hall of Fame. It's different in college football. I kind of feel like your college coach, Dato, Augie, a lot of these guys, I feel like they belong in Cooperstown. Yep. What do you think? You know, I never thought of it until you just said it, and I think it's brilliant. Um, I, I don't know why they're not there. You know, I, I can understand from a player standpoint that you keep it to what they did at the major league level. Um, but you're right. I mean, the impact that those coaches have had on a lot of, you know, some of the guys that are within those halls, but clearly have had on the greater game itself when it goes up to the major league level is massive. Hey, it's a great idea. Lead the charge. I'll sign, I'll sign the bottom of the letter or okay. the, the side of the letter. You sign the bottom of the letter. I'll, I'll sign as a contributor. Yeah. I, I think that's a hell of an idea. All right, well, I'll write it up. I know Tim Mead is the president of the Hall of Fame, and I got to know him when he was uh, the media guy with the Angels, and I worked in the Angels system. So maybe we might have a little bit of an in here. I'll see what we can All do right. about that. I, I wanted I to like ask it. you about um, one of your former teammates in college, uh, A.J. Hinch, who, gosh, I mean, he's had a pretty interesting few years, and his Tigers are starting to play a little bit better over the last week or so. Um What's it been like from your perspective on seeing what he's dealt with, going from the highs of the highs of winning a world championship and then dealing with this scandal that it seemed like he was trying to end and be banished from the game and just an amazing situation he's dealt with? Yeah, I mean, you know, we texted a little bit through it. Um, I I don't, you know, AJ had to stay in touch, but not great touch. So it wasn't like, you know, we were leaning on each other. He was calling me during it, but just looking at it from afar with a, a human that you know really well. Um, he's a good person. I know he is. If, I mean, I've been around him enough in good times, bad times, hard times. And he screwed up. I mean, it's just that simple. And I know that he's said as much and obviously has paid his penance. And, and I'm glad that he's, I'm glad that he's back in the game because I think it's a place that he deserves. I think he can positively impact organizations. Um, I know he can positively impact kids and, you know, it's a little bit of a reclamation project there, but he, he knew what he was getting into. I mean, they're young and doesn't always mean it's going to work. You know, he was in a similar situation when he started with Arizona. Um, it's just good to see him back. And I think that I know that he's got a different perspective on the game and he's got a much different perspective on life given what he's gone through. Kyle Peterson joining us here on Halftime. KP, when you look at the Razorbacks, and obviously all of our listeners want to hear your thoughts on this Razorback baseball team that we got going here, and arguably the guy that's got most of the notoriety this year is Kevin Copps, and his, he's pitched an absolute beauty so far this season. Is he SEC Pitcher of the Year material? And then I want to follow up with something here just in a moment with Kevin Copps, but is he SEC Pitcher of the Year material? Yeah, he is. I said it on the air the other day. He, I mean, he's my pick right now. I don't I don't know how you can make an argument that any pitcher in the league has had more of an Im- has had an impact on more games than he has. Um, I mean, he led him in innings last weekend, and he didn't start a game. I mean, he goes three on Friday, goes three and two thirds on Sunday, and it's the two games that they win. And and I, you know, you guys can probably go back over the course of the season. I can't roll that off the top of my head, but. He's, I mean, when it's tight and when it matters, he's in there. And when he's been in there, he's been as good as anybody in the country. And so I know it's a little bit, especially with, I mean, Rockers had an unbelievable season. Jack Ladder's had an unbelievable season. Uh, McKaysey's had an unbelievable season. Doug McKaysey's had a great year. But I don't, nobody's impacted more games than he has. And that's, that's why for me, um, and it's not a slight on anybody else, it's just, it's just an understanding of, man, this this guy has been that good over the course of the season. I think he deserves it. KP, remember when the days where uh, relief pitchers were failed starters 
It's, it's not quite yeah. like that all the time anymore, and certainly uh-uh. it isn't with Kevin Cobb. We've got callers that think he should be a starter exactly the way you're putting it. There's no pitcher in the country that's affected more games than him. Mm-hmm. No, and, you know, it's his ability to, to you know, I, I don't I would assume he he might have more non three out saves than three out saves over the course of the season, and and the wins total is crazy. And you know the wins is just telling he's coming in and either games that it's tight or he's coming in games that they're down by a run or two, and ultimately he's held the fort down long enough because you know that offense. If you give him enough time, that offense is going to put some runs on the board. Um, it's been fascinating to watch. I mean, it reminds me a little bit when Mississippi State made their run to Omaha a few years ago and played for the national title. It was a pitching staff that was built from the back, and it was a bullpen that, that it was really like, okay, how are we going to get there? And where we, it, it, how many can we get from our starters? But ultimately, it's the back end of the bullpen that's going to win the game for us. So th- there's no – I mean, I, I think you look at your dudes and say, okay, I know that the book most of the time is this, but our, our pages look a little bit different this year. And they've done a really good job of understanding what those pages are, and the most important one is cops. KP, before we let you go, I want to ask you also about Dave Van Horn. And obviously this year, we, I, and we, I think we, have, we might have had you on prior to the baseball season and everything with the loaded rosters that all these baseball teams are going to be having yeah. this year. And from top to bottom, the SEC, is a, I mean, it's as strong as it's ever been. But with Dave Van Horn, 19-8 and eight inside the conference play, you're a game away from a 40-win season. And to me, uh, yes, I have the Arkansas bias glasses on, but KP, he's got to be SEC Coach of the Year, right? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, I, you know, Tony's got to be in that discussion too, based mm-hmm. on what happens over the course of the weekend. I think sometimes, and and I think coaches are um, they fall victim to their success, previous success, when it comes to coach of the year type stuff, because ultimately, if you've been there a lot, I think a lot of times I start to look other play. Well, yeah, they're good every year. So, you know, what is well, what's different is them want to or they haven't lost the series. And that doesn't happen in this league. Right. It just does not happen in this league. So, you know, I, I don't even know if he cares about stuff like that. It would shock me if he really doesn't. Um, but I don't know how you put anybody on the line above. Because, I mean, you guys see this league every week, and, and I've not had a chance to see this league every week for the last 15 years. And they're anything like it. There just isn't anything like it. And if you can roll through, even if they only went 9 out of 10, but if you roll through the, the year and you don't lose a weekend series, I don't care how good you are. Uh, the guy leading you is really good because that's just it's it's that hard to do. Last thing, KP, and I'll let you go. I went I went back through your numbers uh, for from your professional career, and I I was able to go <laughs> back and look. You see, he laughs, but this is not this is impressive though. This is a great Kyle Peterson statistic. Barry Bonds was zero for three against him. You got Bonds every time. You didn't strike him out, but you got him three times. Do you remember these at bats? Hell yes, I remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm gonna. So I got him once in spring training too. I faced him once in spring training. It was my first spring training start. Um, but the game that I got him, we got beat two one. Uh, F.E. Santangelo hit a ball to center field that moved in a way I've never seen a baseball move. Marquise Grissom broke one way, it moved the other way on a ball that never should have. We got beat 2 1. Bonds popped up to the catcher twice and grounded out to second. I don't remember in what order. Um, but, <laughs> dude, I don't have too many of those. <laughs> so I can promise you, I remember when I faced Bonds. I remember when I faced Sosa. I remember when I faced Pujols. And I remember every one of my four hits. <laughs> Every one of them. I could take you through those two if you want them. Uh, we'll, we'll do that another time because I plan on having you yeah, next I'm month. I'm sure the audience is just on the edge head. of their seat to hear that one. Yeah, well, it's always good stuff. I also saw Adrian Belcher is three for three against her, so it does balance out. Yo, um, good. Appreciate you, Kyle, for coming on. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you this week. Well, we won't see you this weekend. We'll see you next week in Hoover. Thanks, brother. Uh, it sounds good. Bye, guys. All right. That's a lot of fun talking with That's right. It's pretty rare you talk to someone that held Barry Bonds to a zero batting average over the course of his career. So is Kyle stuff. Peterson better than Barry Bonds? Is that logic logical? Yeah, those, yeah, those three at-bats he was. Okay, all right. That's all that matters at that moment.
Uh, 877-377-6963 to close out this first hour with us. Brought to you by Riley Farm Dental at 5901 Riley Park Drive, Suite A. That's Dr. Bo Sparkman and Dr. Brogan serving to give patients better lives with comfortable experiences. They'll provide all dental procedures, braces, implants, cosmetics. Just go to RileyFarmDental.com to learn more. Been voted top three best of the best every year since 2017. 226-3500, the phone number, 226-3500, RileyFarmDental.com. Wrapping up that first hour next.